All right, Paul, when we were looking earlier, you know, there was only a few of those really bright stars around zero. As we got to magnitude four or five, they're harder to see. You can see them in the small telescope, but there's more of them. Yeah. And as you said, you know, Uranus may have been even spotted before, but they didn't appreciate what it was. So how do you actually find kind of the needle in the haystack when you're finding more of every faint object? Yes, yeah, so this is a problem that you and your research are very familiar with, yeah. um, which is, let's say you have a big enough telescope to see something. The trouble is there's a lot of boring things out yeah. there at the same brightness. And how, in your case, you're looking for exploding stars, supernovae. Right. But for every star that explodes, it just looks like a dot amongst the tens of millions of other dots that aren't exploding. Exactly. Um, and so this is a problem as they started looking fainter than Uranus. So Uranus, at that brightness, there are only you know, 8,000 things in the sky. So that means it's actually feasible. Let's say you look at 100 of them a night, yeah. which you, you could. Ten, 10 an hour, you could do that. That's, that's a very reasonable um, hour. Yeah. And then do that for 100 nights. You would have seen them all quite easily, yeah. even so, with some room to spare with bad weather and so things. Everything at that level of brightness, it's feasible for you two or three astronomers working assiduously for a few years to look at all of them and see if they're moving. That's right. But now let's say we go another two or three magnitudes fainter. Okay. So now talking things another 20, 30 times fainter maybe. Okay. Now, instead of having uh, only 10,000 in the sky, there might be a few hundred thousand in the sky. Yeah, that's going to be a very long year, let's say that. You're going to have to do either a lot per... I don't even think you can do that many per night, really. No, I mean, I, I suppose in principle you could get new teams of hundreds of astronomers with hundreds of telescopes, each looking at hundreds of these things going for decades to try and find the one that's moving. But it'd be a lot easier if you knew roughly where to look in the sky. Yeah, that would help, because even if you just narrow down a bit, then your list is, say... Only a few thousand, and again, that's a lot more manageable. That's something one person can do that's again. That's right. So a lot of people trying to figure out roughly where it's going to be, and the method they were using was looking at the perturbations of the known planets. Okay. So the idea is, say there's some unknown planet further out than Uranus. Yep. That's of course we know there is. Um, it'll pull on Uranus, and also on Saturn and Jupiter. Yep. And the inner solar system as well, but they're far away and probably harder to measure. And for example, here it's pulling it forward, so it might make it move a bit faster. Whereas there, it's behind it and pulling it backwards a bit. Okay. So what you might expect is to see the speed of the planet very slightly as it goes around. So if you monitor the known planet, in this case Uranus, a few times, or Jupiter in this yep. case, you may be able to see different rates it's moving at different times, giving you a clue as to where that something may be tugging you. Yes. Now, part of the trouble is that um, when these, uh, Uranus was discovered, um, they only, I mean, it takes eight, more than 80 years to go around the sun. Yeah. So, luckily, they, had, they would go back and look at you know, Galileo's records and other ones previously and try and put them together. But a lot of these old records were very inaccurate. That's right. So, they had some good data for a few years since they've known it was there, and then some more ratty stuff back when people didn't know what it was. Yep. And they're trying to combine that all to actually measure an orbit, but they didn't really have a, like a, a decent measurement of one that's orbit right. and, to and, go and, by. And, and, yeah, for 80 years, that's a lot of pointing and measuring for, to figure yes. out where this other thing may be. But in a great triumph of early 19th century mathematics, a whole bunch of people were trying to look at what the orbit of Uranus should have been, and also Saturn, yep. and what it actually was, and was there a difference, and was that difference real, yep. or was it just due to measurement error and all some of these old ratty measurements? So they invented a whole bunch of science about trying to put uncertainties on measurements yep. to try and see whether something was accurate, not a lot of the uh, basis of modern statistics was actually produced in the whole process of trying to work this out. And eventually, um, Le Verrier and Adams, competing in England and France, uh, both were able to say, OK, we think it's not going in the shape we expect it to be. This is very difficult mathematics because they had to look, they had to allow, for example, for the perturbation that Jupiter That's causes right. on them, and Saturn calls, and they all cause each other. Exactly. And they didn't have computers, so this would be a very easy thing to do with modern computers, but for them they had to do it step by step by That's hand. Right. Back then a computer was a person. Yes. A person would do one line of a calculation by hand, and then the next line, and the next line. Um, so it was an incredibly difficult calculation, but eventually they were able to say, okay, we think there is something out there, it's going to have roughly the same mass as Uranus, and it's going to be in that position on the sky. And astronomers went out to look there, and they found they now only had a few hundred objects to look at in that small area, rather than having to do the hundreds of thousands over the entire sky, and they found one that showed a disk and was moving. So, And I think this is the amazing dis discovery of Uranus. It's the math that predicted it, 
And then fairly quickly after this prediction, Neptune was confirmed to be real. Yes, so the discoverer um, gave credit to the mathematicians. Not he, yeah. he thought his job was fairly straightforward. They told him where to look, he looked, but it was really the Leverrier and Adams who uh, did the hard work That's on this right. one. And in some sense, it was a great triumph. Uh, this made the discoverers totally famous. Um, Part of the trouble was whenever you get a big famous breakthrough, everyone tries to duplicate it. That's right. And that can sometimes cause problems. So what, of course, people immediately said is, okay, well, let's maybe there's something else. So let's look at Neptune's orbit it's, and see if yeah. there's something further out. That's right. Now, the first thing they looked at was actually, there's Neptune. Um, and here's its brightness and distance from the sun. So it's getting quite a bit fainter. Definitely um, out of the range of any human eye. But still, again, even a small telescope in a city can see Neptune. The, so the problem is not seeing it. The problem is no, we see a lot of other things of the same brightness and which right. one is what you're after. And you're not going to really notice it night to night, it moving that much. No. Um, the next time they applied it was actually to not outwards, but inwards. Okay. So they found that Mercury's orbit was not behaving the way they'd expect. Ah, so another planet inside Mercury and the Sun? Yes, that's what people were thinking, uh, that... Um, Again, it was a complicated calculation because you know, Mercury is not quite behaving, but of course Mercury is being pulled around by right. Venus and Earth That's and Mars right. and Jupiter. So you had to calculate all of those. It's also perturbed by the fact that the Sun is not quite a, a sphere but bulges around the middle. Yep. And they had to allow for all that. But still, when they tried to allow for all those things, it seemed that Mercury was not quite behaving the way it should have been. Okay. So there's speculation that there might be another planet further in, which they called a Vulcan. Okay. So this would be closer to the Sun than Mercury. Yeah. But just small and not discovered previously? Well, it would have to be reasonable size to be able to, to put yeah. Mercury around. And the question is, why wouldn't you see it? Something that close to the sun should be pretty bright. That's right. Now, it's hard to see things close to the sun because the sun tends to be up. Yep. But if you, especially when there's an eclipse or something like this, That's right. it would be, you'd think it'd be pretty easy to see. And no one could see this damn thing. Hmm. And eventually it was turned out that Yes, Mercury is not behaving the way it was expected to, but that was actually not because of an inner planet. It was because of the warping of space-time caused by Einstein's theory of general relativity. So, in fact, they were right, but they were kind of two steps beyond being right. They were to a new level of rightness. It was a new law of physics, and this was actually like the first evidence that Einstein's yes. general relativity was correct, was that it, it pr explained the weird motion yes. of Mercury. So, no planet further in needed. It was, very, it was a true observation, it was very exciting, but the explanation was a new law of physics, not a, a new planet. Still exciting, though, and still, again, shows that the method is still working. That's right.